Hey everyone, my name is Trevor, and in this video we're going to expand on the save and load system created through a couple of previous tutorials to handle multiple saved games through save slots. We'll cover how to organize our game's data to support multiple saved games, and also how to display that information nicely to the player in a save slots menu, where we can use those save slots to start a new game with or load an existing game from. And as an added bonus, we'll also modify the continue button on the main menu to load the most recently played saved game. And just as a quick disclaimer, this tutorial is going to contain a lot of details specific to the save and load system and main menu that have already been created through two previous tutorials. So if you haven't seen the previous two videos on how this system was created, I highly recommend going through those first and then coming back to this tutorial afterwards. And of course, as with any of my tutorials, everything we're going to do can be found on the GitHub project, which will be linked in the description of this video. Now before we jump into implementing anything, I want to give a quick overview of how this is going to work. In the save and load system that we're starting with, there's a singleton class called the Data Persistence Manager that manages our game data and also exposes some methods to allow the orchestration of saving and loading that data from any other script. The Data Persistence Manager uses a class called the File Data Handler to interact with storing and accessing data on our machine's local file system. This includes serializing our data and writing it to a file, as well as deserializing our data and reading it from that file. The idea behind having a separate class to handle interactions with the method of storage is that it keeps the rest of our system mostly decoupled from the method of storage that we're using. In other words, this makes it easier to expand on or change the method of storage in the future if we choose to do so. This is important for this tutorial because different methods of storage might have their own way of dealing with multiple saved games, so we'll want to keep that in mind for how we organize the code that we're going to write. With all of that said, when it comes to storing multiple saved games in a file system, it's actually going to be a really simple addition to the save and load system that we're starting with. Each save slot in the save slots menu will have a unique ID associated with it that we'll refer to as the profile ID. The profile ID will be used to differentiate between different game data files stored in our method of storage. For a file system, we can modify our file data handler to take in the profile ID when saving or loading data, and then instead of saving that data straight to a single file, we'll organize the different save Saved games into folders which names match that profile ID, each with their own saved data file inside of them. And since these save slots are the ones dictating this profile ID, they can easily display information from the corresponding game data, or just the word empty if there is no game data that exists yet for that profile ID. From there, when a save slot is used to start a new game or load an existing game, we'll just have to keep track of the currently selected profile ID in the Data Persistence Manager, and then use that for any saving and loading that occurs throughout the remainder of the game. We'll also timestamp our data every time we save the game so that we can keep track of which save slot was most recently used. With that information available, we can use the continue button on the main menu to continue straight from that most recently played game without having to go through the save slots menu at all. And that's how it's going to work. Now let's jump into Unity and start implementing this. But first, I want to give a quick recap of what our starting point looks like for this project. We already have a simple simple main menu scene as well as a gameplay scene from the previous tutorials. From the main menu, we can start a new game which puts our data in a clean slate and transitions us to the gameplay scene, or if data already exists, we can continue from that saved data. Right now, when our system saves data, it's simply saved to the application.persistentdatapath directory as either a JSON or encrypted JSON format depending on how our data persistence manager is configured. The project is using TextMesh Pro, which you can install through through Unity's package manager, as well as Unity's new input system, which can also be installed through the package manager. If you're using Unity's default input system though, that's completely fine, just keep in mind that when dealing with the menu navigation, your event system is going to look a bit different than mine. Now that we've recapped where we're starting from, the first thing we're going to do is make some modifications to the data persistence manager and file data handler classes so that we can support persisting multiple save files. As mentioned in the beginning of this video, we're going to do this by putting the data for each save profile in different folders which names represent the ID corresponding to that profile. We'll open up the file data handler class which is responsible for interacting with the file storage, and in there we already have two methods set up to load data from a file and save data to a file. To add the directory layer that we need, it's a really simple change from how we already have things set up. 
In the load method, we'll just pass in a string parameter called profile ID, and then when we're building the path in which to save our data, we'll insert the profile ID string into the middle of the directory and the file name, like so. And then we'll do the same thing with the save method. Next, we'll actually need to pass this in when we call these methods, which is done in the Data Persistence Manager. So back in Unity, we'll open up the Data Persistence Manager script by double-clicking it. Towards the top of this file, we'll add a private string variable called selected profile ID, which is eventually going to keep track of which profile we currently have selected. But for now, we'll just call this test so we can make sure that things are working so far. Then when we call the data handler load method, we'll pass that in. And likewise, when we call the data handler save method, we'll pass it in there as well. And just so we don't get confused, we'll delete any saved data we previously had, and then we'll play the main menu scene to try this out. We'll select new game to start a new game, and then exit play mode, which will save our data. If we check where our data previously was, instead of seeing a data file, we'll now see a directory called test, and our data file will be inside of there instead. And of course, if we change the selected profile ID to something else like test2, and then do that again, we'll see a test2 directory show up with a different data file in it, which shows that this is working so far. Next, we'll start adding some of the changes needed to support the save slots menu. Right now, our system can only load a single profile at a time, but for the save slots menu, we'll need to show data from each profile all at the same time. We're going to keep things simple for this tutorial and add a method to our file data handler to load all of the existing profiles at once. Back in the file data handler class, we'll create a public method called load all profiles that returns a dictionary that maps a string, which will be the profile ID, to a game data object, which will be the game data corresponding to that profile ID. The first thing we'll need to do is create a new dictionary called profile dictionary and then return that at the bottom of this method. Now in between here we'll need to loop over all of the directory names in the directory that we're storing the data in. We can do that by creating a new directory info object with our data dir path which represents the directory where our data lives and then call enumerate directories on that which gives us a collection of directory infos that we can iterate over. And then we can loop through those in a for each loop like so. And just as a quick note, you'll need to add a using statement for system.io for your code to recognize the directory info class, as well as a couple other classes that we're about to use. Back in that for each loop, we can get the name of the directory we're iterating over, or in other words, our profile ID, by calling durinfo.name. And as a bit of a defensive programming check, we'll also make sure our data file actually exists in that folder before we try to load it and add it to the dictionary. This is important because if other directories get put in that main directory for any reason, they may not actually relate to our saved data and instead may represent other data our application is storing. So we can check this by creating the full path using path.combine, and then using an if statement to check if the data file does or doesn't exist at that full path. And if it doesn't, we'll give ourselves some warning logging and then use the keyword continue to immediately continue to the next dir info in our directory infos. Now if we get past that check, that means the file does exist and we can try to load it and add it to the dictionary. We'll take advantage of our load method that's already been created in this class to get the game data for that profile ID. And then we'll do one one last defensive programming check to make sure that the data isn't null. Since we've already checked that the file exists, this shouldn't happen unless something goes horribly wrong with loading the data, in which case we'll log an error to let ourselves know. And of course, if we successfully loaded the game data, meaning it's not null, we'll add it to the dictionary using the profile ID as the key and the profile data as the value. And that completes the method that we can use to get the game data from each profile all at once. Next, we want to be able to get that data from other scripts, so back in the data persistence manager, we'll add a public method called get all profiles game data that returns a string to game data dictionary, then call the method in the file data handler we just created and return the result of that. The next thing we'll focus on is setting up the save slots menu. Back in Unity, under the canvas, we'll create a new empty game object called save slots menu. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to duplicate the new game button we already have using control plus D on Windows rename the game object to save slot, 
and then move it under the Save Slots Menu Game Object in the Scene Hierarchy. And for now, I'm just going to disable the Main Menu Game Object so that we can focus on building out our Save Slots Menu. For the Save Slot button, we'll make it a bit bigger, a width of 750 and a height of 200 seem pretty good. And as for the colors, we're just going to go with what was duplicated from the New Game button. We'll be writing a script a bit later to deal with when this is clicked, but for now, let's clear the on click method so that it doesn't confuse us later on. So how we're going to do this is that we're going to have two different setups for this save slot. One for when there is no data for that profile and another for when there is data. We'll create two new empty game objects under the save slot game object, one called no data content and another called has data content. For no data content, we'll just move this text mesh pro text into it and then change the text to say empty. We'll also rename the game object to say empty text just for organizational purposes. For when there is data, instead of showing the word empty, we'll want to show some information about the game data. For this example, we're just going to show the percentage the game has been completed as well as the amount of times that the player has died. We'll just duplicate the empty text game object with Ctrl plus D on Windows, rename it to percentage complete text, and then put in some placeholder text like 82% complete, and then move that under the has data content game object. And just so we can see this a bit better, we'll disable the no data content game object for right now. Then we'll duplicate that text, rename that game object to death count text, change the text itself to say death count colon 26 as a placeholder, make the text a bit smaller, and then position it right under the percentage complete text in the scene. And I think that looks pretty good for the save slot. In a bit, we'll duplicate this for multiple save slots, but we'll get one working first. We'll also want to have a back button so we can go back to the main menu. We can just duplicate the new game button from the main menu, rename the game object to back button, remove the on click listener that was copied, change the text to say back, move it under the save slots menu, and then position it in the scene to be at the very bottom of the screen. So now let's actually write some code to make this functional. We'll start with creating a script we can attach to the save slot to manage what the save slot should show. In the scripts main menu folder of the project, we'll create a new C -sharp script called save slot and then double click it to open it up. First, we can get rid of these placeholder methods. Each save slot is going to have a profile ID associated with it, so we'll define that here and make it a serialized field variable so we can choose which profile ID this save slot will correspond to. We also want references to the no data content and has data content game objects so that we can toggle them on or off depending on if there's data for that profile. And we'll also want references to anything else that needs to be set based on our game data. So in this case, that's going to be the percentage complete text and the death count text. And since these are text mesh pro objects, we'll need to add a using statement for TM Pro at the top of this script. Then we'll create a set data method that we'll call from another script that we're going to make next. The method will take in a game data object and we'll check if the data is null, which will tell us whether or not data exists for this save slots profile ID. When there isn't data, we'll set the no data content game object to be active and the has data content game object to be inactive. And when there is data, we'll do the opposite so that the has data content game object is the one that's active. We also want to set the contents of our display here depending on the game data for this profile. We're saving the death count to our game data directly, so that's easily accessible. However, we're not directly saving the percentage our game has been completed, but instead that needs to be calculated from other game data that we have saved. One way to go about this in the save and load system that we're using is to add a method in the game data class to calculate and return that information. So in the game data class, we'll create a new method called get percentage complete. In this case, this is a very simple game where the only objective is collecting coins. So we'll just loop through our data to see how many coins that we've collected. Then we'll divide the total coins collected by the total amount of coins and then multiply that by 100 to get the percentage. And of course, we don't want to divide by zero, so we'll make sure that the count is not zero before we do that calculation. And in this case, I also don't want to display any decimals, which is why I'm returning this as an integer, but you could return this as a float and format it if you do want decimals. Now back in the save slot script, we can set the percentage complete text using the method that we just created in our game data class, and we can also set the death
death count text using the death count directly from our game data. And finally, we'll want to add a public git method to return the profile ID that corresponds to this save slot, which is going to be used by another script we'll create in just a bit. Now back in Unity, let's attach this script to the save slot we have by clicking on it in the scene hierarchy and then dragging the script onto it. Then we'll drag in all of the corresponding content from the scene hierarchy, and for right now we're going to leave the profile ID blank. Next, we're going to create a script that's going to control our save slots menu as a whole, which is also going to appropriately set the display content for each save slot. In the scripts main menu folder of the project, we'll create a new C -sharp script called save slots menu and then double click it to open it up. We'll create a private save slot array called save slots and then in the awake method, we'll use the git components in children method to initialize this variable with all of the child save slot objects under the game object that this script will be attached to. Right now, of course, we only have one, but we're going to write this script as if we have multiple. We can then create a method called activate menu, which we'll expand on later, but for right now, we'll just want to set the save slots appropriately depending on our save data. We can call the data persistence manager get all profiles data method that we created earlier to get a dictionary containing any data profiles we have saved. Then we'll loop through each of the save slots and then see if the profile ID of our save slot lines up with any of the data that we've loaded by trying to get that data out of the dictionary using the save slots profile ID. Regardless of if the data exists or not, we'll call set data on that save slot, which if you recall has a null check to determine whether or not data exists, in which case it'll display different content depending on if there was save data or not. Eventually, we're going to call this activate menu method when navigating from the previous menu, but for now, just so we can see this working, let's create a start method and then call activate menu from there. Now back in Unity, we'll drag the save slots menu script into the inspector while clicked on the save slot menu game object to add it as a component. Then let's hit play and see if this is working so far. As we can see, the save slot menu displays as empty, which is perfect since right now our profile ID for the save slot is an empty string, which we don't have any save data for. As a reminder from earlier in this tutorial, we have two save profiles in our data right now with the profile IDs being test and test2. So if we stop play mode and then replace the profile ID for this save slot with test and then play it again, we'll see that instead of being empty, the save slot shows the save data just like we want it to. And that shows that everything is working up to this point. The next thing we're going to do is set up the menu navigation so that we can get to this save slots menu through our main menu when we click new game. Real quick, in Unity's scene hierarchy, we'll disable the save slots menu and then enable the main menu. Then we'll open up the main menu script by double clicking it. At the top, we'll add a section for menu navigation and add a serialized field private variable for the save slots menu. Then when the new game button is clicked, instead of creating a new game and loading the gameplay scene, we'll remove all of that and instead activate our save slots menu by calling save slots menu dot activate menu. And right after that, we'll call this dot deactivate menu, which is a method that we're going to create. In this main menu script, we'll create two new public methods called activate menu and deactivate menu, which are going to correspond to when the main menu is either activated or deactivated. For this menu, it's really simple. We'll just set the game object to be active when we activate and then inactive when we deactivate. Next, in the save slots menu class, let's remove the start method completely. In activate menu at the very top, we'll set this game object to be active and we'll also create a deactivate menu method and set the game object to be inactive in there. And of course, we're going to want to add the capability to navigate back to the main menu. So just like in the main menu, we'll add a section for menu navigation at the top of the script but this time the variable is going to be the main menu. And then we'll create a method called onBackClicked, which is going to be the onClick listener for the menu's back button, and in there we'll activate the main menu and then deactivate the save slots menu right after. Now back in Unity, let's hook all of this up in the inspector. We'll drag in the save slots menu under the main menu and then drag in the main menu under the save slots menu to hook up the navigation between the two. And then under the back button, we'll add an onClick listener, drag in the save slots menu game object, and then select 
select the on back click function that we created. Then we can hit play to see how things go. You'll notice right after we click the new game button, it transitions us to the save slots menu correctly, but all of a sudden we can't click anything. This is because of how the first selected variable works in Unity's event system. There's an odd quirk though that we have to deal with where if we try to set the selected game object for the event system through code, we'll end up with an issue where the newly selected button won't be highlighted. I'm not sure if there's a better way to handle this or not, but the main way that I've found is to set the currently selected game object for Unity's event system to null, then wait until the end of the frame, and then set the selected game object to the one that we want using a coroutine. But if anyone watching has a better way to go about this, please feel free to mention it in the comments. Anyways, we'll do this in a menu script that our other menus can inherit, so that way we only have to write this code once. In the script's main menu folder, we'll create a new c -sharp script called menu and then double click it to open it up. At the top, we'll create a game object variable for the first selected button for that menu. We'll also add a using statement for Unity Engine.event systems. Then, in an on enable method, which will make protected and virtual so that other scripts can overwrite it if needed, we'll start a coroutine called set first selected and then pass in that first selected variable. And then we'll create a coroutine method called set first selected, where we'll set the event system's current selected object to null, wait for the end of the frame, and then set the event system's current selected object to be that first selected variable. Now in our save slots menu script, we can extend from this menu script instead of mono behavior, and then we can do the same thing for the main menu script. Then back in Unity, we'll drag in the new game button as the first selected for the main menu, and then we'll drag in the save slot for the first selected in our save slots menu. And then we can hit play, and we'll see that we can navigate around between the two menus just as we'd expect. But of course, if we click the save slot right now, nothing happens because we haven't hooked this up to an on-click listener yet, so we'll do that next. But before we do that, we're going to need to be able to change the selected profile ID in our Data Persistence Manager. So in the Data Persistence Manager script, we'll add a public method called change selected profile ID that takes in a string, and in there we'll set the selected profile ID to the one being passed in. We'll also call load game right after this so that the game data that's in memory for the Data Persistence Manager will always immediately get loaded to correspond to the profile that we changed to. Then back in the Save Slots menu script, we'll create a new method called on save slot clicked that will take in a save slot. First, we'll update the selected profile according to the save slot that was clicked by calling the method that we just created in the Data Persistence Manager. Then we'll call the Data Persistence Manager to create a new game, which will initialize our data to default values. And then finally, we'll load the gameplay scene asynchronously, which in this case is just called sample scene. And to do this, we'll need to add a using statement for Unity Engine Management to the top of this script. And while it's not at all required, something I like to do when locking in a menu option is to disable all of the other buttons in the menu just to prevent something from getting double clicked while the scene is loading. At the top of this method, we'll call a method called disable menu buttons that we're going to create. Then we'll create a new method called disable menu buttons at the bottom of this class. To disable the save slot buttons, we'll need to add something to the save slot script. In the save slot script, we'll add a using statement for UnityEngine.UI, and then we'll add a private button called save slot button. Then we'll get a reference to this by creating an awake method and then calling get component for the button component. And last, at the bottom, we'll create a public method called set interactable that takes in a boolean and then sets the button's interactable field to the boolean that's passed in. Now back in the save slots menu script, we can loop through each save slot and then set it to be non-interactable here. And we'll also add a using statement statement for UnityEngine.UI and then add a serialize field button for the back button and then set that to be non-interactive as well in the disable menu buttons method so that all buttons can no longer be clicked when this method is called. Back in Unity, we can drag in the back button to our save slots menu. Then we'll go into our save slot game object and then add an on click listener. We'll drag in the save slots menu game object and then select the on save slot click method that we created. And finally, we'll drag in the save slot game object itself as the parameter to be passed in. And now if we play this and then click that profile, it throws us into our gameplay scene from the start, just as we'd expect for starting a new game. And if we exit right away and then go back to our save slots, we'll see 
that the data has in fact reset and we're sitting at 0% for that saved game. Now that we have a single save slot working for a new game, let's duplicate this so that we have multiple save slots in the UI. For right now, we'll disable the main menu and enable the save slots menu so that we can see things better while we're working on them. It would be a good idea to turn the save slot game object into a prefab so that if things change in the future, it's easy for us to modify a single save slot and then apply that change to all of them. We can do that by dragging the save slot game object into the prefabs folder like so. And for the prefab, we'll make the profile ID be blank. Then in the scene hierarchy, we can duplicate that save slot with Control D on Windows, create four of them in total, and then drag them around the scene so they're positioned one after another, like so. Then for the profile IDs, I'm just going to keep things simple and start with the number zero and then increment up to three so each has a unique profile ID where zero is at the top and then three is at the bottom. Then we can disable the save slots menu again and then enable the main menu. And now that we have something working, I'm going to delete the previously saved data we have so it doesn't interfere and we're starting from a clean slate. And after that we can hit play and play around with this a bit and we'll see that going through the new game button on our main menu is creating new games according to the save slots that we select. Of course though, that doesn't do much good unless we can load the game as well, so let's implement that next. In Unity, we'll just duplicate the continue button, rename the game object to load game button, remove the on click listener function for now, change the text to say load game, and then drag it down just a bit in the scene. The idea here is that we want the new game button and load game button to both navigate us to the save slots menu, except the menu will behave slightly differently depending on which button we navigated from. Back in the save slots menu script, we'll create a boolean called is loading game and initialize it to false. Then we'll take in a boolean parameter through the activate menu method and then set the is loading game variable in this menu according to that parameter. With that in place, we can use this boolean to split some logic throughout this class depending on if we're loading or starting a new game. First, if we're loading, we want to set any of these save slots that don't have data to be inactive so that they can't be clicked. So when we loop through our save slots here, what we can do is say if the data was null and we're loading the game, then set the save slot to be non-interactable, or otherwise set it to be interactable. The only other variation here is how we transition to the next scene and whether we have new data or we load the data from an existing profile. Since the change selected profile ID method also loads the game for us, really all we need to do here is only start a new game if is loading game is false. And then back in the main menu script, when we activate the save slots menu through the new game button, we'll pass in false. And then we'll add a method called on load game clicked, where we'll do pretty much the same as on new game clicked, except when we activate the save slots menu, we'll pass in true to indicate that we're loading. Back in Unity, we need to hook up the load game buttons on click listener by clicking the plus button here, dragging in the main menu game object, and then selecting the on load game clicked method that we just created. Now if we go into play mode and click the load game button, we'll see that the save slots without data can't be selected. And if we load this save slot here, we can see that the game is loaded from where we left off for this saved game just like we wanted. And if we were to choose new game instead, we'd see that all of these save slots can be selected to create a new game with. And if we do so by selecting this save slot again, we can see that it started a new game for that save slot, overwriting our saved data and putting us back to the beginning of the level. Now before we go on to implementing the continue button, there is a small thing that we should fix just really quick. If we get rid of the save data for the first slot and then try to load the game, you'll see that at first nothing is selected. This is because our first selected button in our event system is still the first save slot, but in this case it's non-interactable which makes it look like nothing is selected. Luckily this is a pretty easy fix. In the save slots menu activate menu method, we'll add a game object variable called first selected right above this for loop and then default it to the back button. Then if we enter this else block, we'll check if the first selected is still the back button, and if it is, we'll set it to the save slot instead. And then at the very end of this method, we'll call that coroutine to set the currently selected game object. Now if we go back and play this, we'll see that the first selected option is the first save slot that has data for load game, and it still selects the top slot for new game. The next thing we should do is disable the load game button when there is no data to load. 
in the main menu script, we'll add a serialize field button for the load game button, and just like with the continue game button, we'll set interactable to false if the data persistence manager doesn't have game data. And of course, remember to drag in the load button to the main menu script in Unity. Right now, if we play this, these buttons will be disabled regardless of if there is or isn't data, and this is because in the data persistence manager, we're not loading data at all at startup. How we'll want to go about this is defaulting the game data to one of our profiles if one exists when the data persistence manager first starts up. We could just use the first profile it finds, but we're actually going to timestamp our data every time we save so that we can default to the most recently played saved game. In the game data script, we'll add a public long variable called last updated, which is what we'll use to store a serialized date time object every time we save. And next, in the data persistence manager, we'll scroll down to the save game method. Every time we save the game, we'll update that last updated variable by calling system.datetime.now.toBinary, which gets the current date and time for the system you're running on, and then serializes it to binary which can more easily be saved. Next, in the file data handler class, we need to create a method that'll give us the profile ID for the most recently played profile. So we'll create a public method called get most recently updated profile ID. We'll take advantage of our load all profiles method by calling calling that to get all of these saved profiles. And then in a for each loop, we'll loop through each key value pair where the key is the profile ID and then the value is the game data for that profile. With how the load all profiles method works, we shouldn't be getting any null game data back from it, but even so, it would be a good idea to check if the data is null here as kind of a defensive check, just in case the load all profiles method changes in the future. And for that base case, we'll just continue, which will immediately move on to the next entry in our loop. To keep track of which profile ID was the most recently played, we'll create a string called most recent profile ID at the top of this method and initialize it to null. Then if we get past this base case in our for each loop, that means that data exists and was found for that profile ID. If the most recent profile ID is still null, that means that this is the first saved data that we've come across that exists, so we'll set that one as the most recent profile ID. Otherwise, we'll need to compare the new profile ID to the current most recently played profile ID to determine which one is the most recent. Since these are saved as binary within our data, we'll need to convert them back to the date time objects first, and then we can compare them with a logical operator where we'll check if the new profile's date time is greater than the current most recent date time. If it's greater, that means it was played more recently, and so we'll set the most recent profile ID to the new one. And then at the end of this method, after we've looped through each profile, we'll return the most recent profile ID. And just to note, if we don't have any save data at all, this will end up being null that gets returned from here with how we have things set up. This introduces the possibility of the profile ID being null when we save or load data through the file data handler. And because we're using that to create the full string path with path.combine, this will throw an error if that value is null. There are a lot of ways we could go about managing this, but we're going to keep things simple and just add a base case to the top of the load and save methods for when the profile ID gets passed in as null. So if the profile ID is null when we enter this load method, we can return null here right away, since there wouldn't be any data defined for a null profile ID anyways. And we'll do the same at the top of the save method, except we'll just return. Next, back in the Data Persistence Manager, we'll start out the selected profile ID as an empty string, and then we'll scroll down to the awake method, and right after we've created the data handler, we'll set the selected profile ID equal to the result of the method that we just created. And if we go back into play mode, we're able to select load game again because there is some saved data that we can load. And we can also now select the continue button, which will start the game with the most recently played profile. And just to see this a bit better, we can start another new game and exit to save it. And now when we hit continue, it starts from the new game since we played it most recently instead of the other saved game that we have. And if we delete all of our saved data, we'll see that the continue and load game buttons are non-interactable since we don't have any data to load or continue from, which shows that all of this is implemented just like we wanted. The last thing I want to add for this tutorial are some improvements improvements to the debugging options that we have. These next changes are meant to be used in development when starting up the game through a scene that isn't the main menu, so we'll switch over to the gameplay scene by double-clicking it in the project. 
The first thing we might want to do in development is completely disable data persistence so that the game doesn't save or load at all. In the data persistence manager, we'll add a serialized field private boolean variable called disable data persistence and initialize it to false. Then in the awake method, it's a good idea to make it clear that data persistence is disabled by logging a warning. And next, in load game, if this variable is true, we'll simply return at the top and we'll do the exact same thing for the save game method. Now the next thing that might be useful is to override the selected profile ID. We'll add two variables at the top, one for whether or not to override the profile ID and another for what to override that profile ID to. Then in the awake method at the very end, we'll say that if override selected profile ID is true, then we'll set our selected profile ID equal to the test selected profile ID. And we'll also log a warning in this case just to make it clear to ourselves that the selected profile ID is being overridden. And back in Unity, in the gameplay scene, we can check the override selected profile ID checkbox here and then start the game. We'll see right away the warning login we put in indicating the profile ID was overridden to one called test. And upon saving the game, we'll see that the test directory shows up in our file system as well as a profile. And likewise, we can check the disabled data persistence variable, and if we press play, we'll see that no data was loaded, and of course, when we exit, no data is saved. And that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. This ended up being one of the longer video tutorials I've done, so awesome job if you made it to the end, and I really hope you found it to be helpful in some way. If you did, please give it a thumbs up so more people see it, and if you want to see more from me, be sure to hit the subscribe button as well. Those things can really help a small channel like this, and I appreciate it a ton. Also, be sure to take a look at the pinned comment of this video where I'll put any bug fixes or corrections to things related to this video as appropriate. You're also welcome to come by my Discord server, which is a great place to ask questions, suggest a video topic, or just show off the game that you're creating. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram where I mostly post about the game that I'm creating. Anyways, thanks again for watching, and I hope this was helpful.